Good evening, everyone. I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims, Executive Director here at the Institute of Politics. We are so pleased to welcome this distinguished panel of speakers to campus tonight to discuss how international trade policies are affecting us here in Illinois. I want to give a special thank you to former Representative Peter Roskam, who has been a stellar uh, IOP Pritzker Fellow this quarter. I also wanted to mention a couple of upcoming events. Um, tomorrow at 10 a.m., we have Representative Eric Swalwell of California, uh, likely presidential contender, speculative, speculative, who will be in conversation with Lynn Sweet of the Chicago Sun-Times. Next Wednesday, March 13th, we have teamed up with the Harris School of Public Policy and UChicago Crime Lab to host a forum on the issue of crime and public safety in Chicago. The forum will feature both mayoral candidates, Lori Lightfoot and Tony Preckwinkle. That will be at noon if you'd like to sign up. You can find out more about all of our upcoming events on our website at politics.uchicago.edu. We will take audience questions after the conversation. Um, please line up, oh, sorry, you're not lining up. You are, we're gonna have a handheld that will pass, so raise your hand. Um, as usual, we give priority for the first three questions to students. We also remind you that questions end in question marks. <laughs> Uh, we'd like to ask you please to make sure that your phones are on silent and here to formally introduce our speakers is Paige Brand. Paige is a first year from Spring Branch, Texas, studying public policy and English. She is a writer for The Gate, which is the IOP's online political journal. And this summer she will be heading to Iowa as one of 60 students we are sending to Des Moines for the Iowa Project. Please join me in welcoming Paige to the podium. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this event in the UChicago Institute of Politics speaker series, uh, Trump Trade and Tariffs. I'm so excited to introduce our three speakers and moderator for this evening as they discuss farming and manufacturing in light of new trade policies. Having this discussion on an urban campus in a state that ranks third in the nation for agriculture and has one-tenth of the population in its workforce of manufacturing is itself representative of part of the discussion we hope to have here today. The farm and manufacturing belts have fallen into the trade war zone, and we all want to know what happens next. Here to facilitate this conversation is PJ Hufstetter from Reuters. She's an agriculture and commodity reporter who specializes in covering international trade and the farm economy. She's worked for Reuters for eight years, and before that, she was a correspondent and Midwest Bureau Chief for the LA Times. Our first speaker, Brian Duncan, is Vice President of the Illinois Farm Bureau. In his capacity as Vice President of the Bureau, he is also Vice President of Country Financial, Illinois Agricultural Service Company, and the IAA Foundation. Duncan and his wife Kelly own and operate a diversified grain and livestock farm where they grow mostly corn along with soy and some wheat row crops. Along also with us today is Mr. Zachary Model, Chief Alignment Officer of Atlas Toolworks. He's the fourth generation of his family to own and operate Atlas, a precision manufacturing facility offering a broad array of metal manufacturing services. He also serves as the TMA PAC Chairman for the Technology and Manufacturing Association of Illinois and as the Acting Vi Village President of Burr Ridge, Illinois. He previously served on the Manufacturing Council for the U.S. Department of Commerce. Finally, I would like to welcome former Congressman Peter Roskam. He has been an IOP Pritzker Fellow for this past quarter and prior to that was a six-term congressman representing suburban Chicago. In the House of Representatives, he chaired three major subcommittees of the Ways and Means Committee and as Chairman of Tax Policy Subcommittee, he was a Chief Architect in the first major overhaul of the nation's tax code in over three decades. Please join me in welcoming our panel to the stage. Well, so much to talk about when it comes to trade. Um, so thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you to the panelists. Um, let's just go ahead and start with uh, Brian to talk a little bit about not only the trade war with China that, that the U.S. has been going on and on and on with, but also some of the issues with USMCA, TPP. I mean, one of the biggest hurdles for the ag economy has been the fact that there has been so many different fights with so many different export markets, correct? Yeah, correct, and not just fights. Um, you know, the withdrawal from TPP on what day two of the president's administration uh, was, uh, I think, a strategic mistake. And so we've seen other countries move forward. Not only not only are we in fights, but we're not engaged in areas that we could be. We see TPP. What is it called now? TPP ten or TPP eleven moving forward without the United States. Um, and so we see uh, competing countries, agricultural products, having preferential treatment and uh, we, as we uh, would lose shelf space. So 
Yeah, it's, it's been on a number of fronts, BJ. At this point, I know a lot of the discussion in the media has been about the U.S. and China being close to a deal, maybe not a deal, but close to a deal. At this point, for the farm economy in Illinois, ha have we gotten to the point where it's too late for some of the farm economy, that it's just been that, that the prices that we've seen, the drop in, in grain prices has gotten too low, that that it's just going to be too late for these folks, or is it actually been a good negotiating tactic that it could open up even more sales into China, particularly for corn and soybean farmers, for meat manufacturing and meat companies? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, China is a huge buyer. Is there not an opportunity there also? Well, yeah, and I think the question you're answering, if I can use some really highfalutin economic terms, is is the juice going to be worth the squeeze? Right. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, isn't that... Isn't that what we're all kind of wondering here? Um, I think in agriculture, we're really concerned. We know how hard we fought to get into markets, and we know how easy we can lose them. I grew up in the 80s after the grain embargo, and the grain embargo with the Soviet Union created a worldwide shift in how commodities are produced. You saw South America opened up to soybeans. You saw the Ukraine uh, opened up to wheat. We lost markets that we, to this day, have not got back. And I think uh, USDA at their Outlook Forum said uh, right now it's probably 10 years down the road until there's some normality or what we used to think was normal as far as grain export, particularly soybeans, into China. So that's the first part of your question. The second part, too late, um, we're into our sixth year now of declining uh, farm, pr uh, farm profits, farm prices. We're down 50% from where we were six years ago. Uh, we are all hopeful that our lenders are seeing patience, uh, are being patient, and uh, hoping for something significant to happen, I think, this year. is, is uh, I don't want to be sitting here at this time a year from now with no trade agreements, with uh, no USMCA, with uh, perhaps a withdrawal, complete withdrawal from NAFTA. All these things would be devastating uh, to agriculture. 95% of the mouths, PJ, in this world live outside these borders. Um, we, have we are very export dependent. We've built, a, built an agriculture industry to feed the, feed the world, um, export $140 billion worth of goods. So if I'm sitting here a year from now, we're having this same discussion, my answer will be, yeah, it's probably too late. Okay. To follow up on that on the economic side, the White House did, and USDA did offer trade aid for mm -hmm. farmers. Mm -hmm. um, how much are you hearing from farmers now in Illinois that they're banking on a second round of trade aid? Well, I think the White House and Secretary Purdue have been pretty clear that there's not going to be another one coming. Um, so uh, I, think, I think farmers, again, I think are hopeful. I think they're looking to the negotiations, perhaps with the President uh, Z and President Trump, the end of this month. I'm looking forward to getting USMCA in place. I mean, there's a lot of carrots dangling out there right now for agriculture. Uh, I think maybe that's what farmers are more looking at than, than government, uh, government assistance. But I, I mean, I think it's important uh, to understand the unique position farmers occupy. Um, we're price takers. I can't, if, I can't pass higher prices for what I buy onto a, uh, onto a purchaser. I, I take the price that's given. Um, and uh, so we're getting to experience both the, the joy of both ends of these tariffs. In what we buy, we buy a lot of steel, and in what we sell, we've lost a lot of markets for. So I think agriculture kind of is in a, in a unique position. Okay. Zach, following up on that idea of, of trade aid that came to the farm community, we were talking earlier. You know, for manufacturers in general, there really wasn't a lot of aid. I know that there were, you know, companies that were able to apply to be able to become exempt for some of the tariffs. But how has the manufacturing industry really been dealing with the fact that they haven't had the same kind of aid that's come to them? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I think it shouldn't be a trade off between manufacturing and farming. You know, I, I don't think that it's, you know, one or the other. And I think that's what the trade agreements have done up to this point. They've benefited a lot of farmers, but a lot of us in manufacturing feel like we've been sold out. And, and haven't been able to compete so much. And I'd hate to really see the U.S. become simply a, a country that sells uh, our commodities to other countries.
countries, we don't have the high-skilled manufacturing, we don't have the innovation, we don't have the national defense and security that comes along with manufacturing. You know, innovation doesn't just hover above the Great Plains. It is part of the basic manufacturing process, and that's where we get inventions, innovation, and growth and wealth creation. And so I think, you know, from, from trade agreements and from the, the aid perspective in particular, I think, you know, the Trump administration made a commitment. They asked the agriculture secretary secretary to act quick and do something to protect these farmers. I think they were too slow and too little in doing something to help the farmers. So from that perspective, I think they should have acted quicker. But I think in general, neither farmers or manufacturers wants aid. We want to be able to be successful and productive on our own. And I think that, again, uh, the trade agreements haven't really worked for us and, and probably haven't actually worked for the farmers. And that what we really need to do is have a comprehensive agro-industrial policy in this country that a lot of other, all of our other trading partners, quite, quite frankly, have better policies than we do. So there was a lot of discussions, especially in the early part of the Trump administration, kind of the approach with regards to using tariffs and and going back and trying to renegotiate these deals. The idea being of it's important to bring these, these high-skilled jobs back, mm -hmm. to be able to bring manufacturing back. But quite frankly, two plus years in, there has not really been a lot of sign of that happening. Or do you think that even a small aluminum plant coming back online is in fact, a gr you know, that is a movement in the right direction or adding a shift for a steel mill is a move in the right direction because it seems awfully slow. Well, you know, it, it didn't get lost overnight, right? This has been going on for quite a while, so it's going to take some time for things to come back. But we have actually seen quite a bit of increase in manufacturing. And in fact, the jobs are up 264,000. I've got some data in front of me in 2018. That's the largest increase since 1998. Manufacturing production is up 3.2% in 2018. Machinery production, 3.9%. And motor vehicle employment, it's, it passed 1 million employees in October. That's the first time since 2007. And so those are, are national numbers, those correct? Those are national numbers. So we are seeing things um, start to come back here in this country. And I'm a small business, right? I, I have 80 employees. And I, and I feed into global supply chains. For many years, I supplied the telecom industry. And when the tech bubble burst, in fact, my company is 101 years old. For 80 plus years, we grew up with the telecom industry, with Western Electric here. We were part of the switches and housings, those central office stations, and we were part of that innovation in telecom. I mean, this country invented everything out of Bell Labs, funded by taxpayer dollars through our wonderful phone system, and all the laser, the transistor, all that research came out of that high tech, came out of the telephone industry, and we gave it away to China, and now we're watching Huawei. They built a $19 billion company based on corporate espionage, basically stealing trade secrets and, and selling it around the country, around the world. So I think that, you know, manufacturing is coming back, but I'm a supply chain company. So when the telecom industry left, I lost my opportunity to sell to those customers. It wasn't about price. It wasn't about delivery. It wasn't anything I could control. It was that we gave this away to a country that was subsidizing its production. And how can I compete? How can my customers compete? Now I sell in the aerospace industry, right? I'm in the defense industry. My customer Boeing, my customer Northrop Grumman. How can Boeing compete when price doesn't matter? The Chinese are flying their first single body jet. It's flying right now. Boeing has about 10 years, in my opinion, before the same thing happens to them. So again, it's about getting smarter with the policies, and that will keep these jobs coming back, because they are coming back. How long, though, can the US, I mean, for the health of the overall, and, and let's look at just Illinois. How long, really, can the state and the health of the state economy really go without having some of these trade deals in place. And I'm not just talking mm -hmm. between US and China. I'm talking USMCA, like we were talking about TPP. It's true. Like in manufacturing, there are a lot more workers mm -hmm. in manufacturing versus agriculture. Correct. But at a certain point, isn't there a pivot? Like it's gone, we're not having these deals in place for so long ends up hurting both sectors? Well, I'm not opposed to trade deals. I, I just think the deals we've done so far haven't exactly benefited us. But um, as I was saying to you earlier, I, I think trade deals are important. Tariffs are important. These are all parts of the tools and the toolbox to manage our economy. And the big, the big tent is currency, in my opinion. And, and, and I believe that our dollar is, is really overvalued. And that is harming farmers, ranchers, manufacturers, anybody who produces things in this country. The dollar is bloated because it's the reserve currency of the world. And there's a lot of ways 
ways you can solve that. One of my particular favorites is uh, what's called a market access charge. It's just like with the electricity on a hot day. When, when everybody's got their air conditioner going, it's 90 degrees outside, they don't cut off the power. They just make it more expensive. They, they, they charge a, a higher price for it on those days. So I think there are there's some really unique ways with the market access charge and dollar denominated transactions we could help bring the dollar back to a trade balancing equilibrium. And then trade agreements and tariffs would become a lot less important because currency is really the big, the big dog in the room. All right, so let me ask you something specifically about your own company. Uh -huh. Obviously, you had said earlier that, and it makes perfect sense. I mean, you've been impacted by, by the tariffs, correct? With well, the tariffs have been helping us. Again, we've seen demand come back. I'm seeing supply chains come back and customers. So, so I'm so busy right now, it's a blessing. We haven't had it like this in a long time. And we have, unfortunately, a skilled workforce shortage is making it hard to keep up with the demand that's coming back. So. So is, our, is essentially the tariffs and the, the trade wars actually pitting industry against industry? Where the White House is picking winners and losers? I've not seen that. I've seen a pretty broad increase from customers all across. You know, so we make stuff for the defense industry. We also make stuff, um, a, a customer that does coat racks and fecks in the coat racks out here. We make parts and pieces for some consumer products. So we're pretty diversified, and I've seen a pretty broad, broad based increase. But we've had some other good things, too, that have happened. You know, the tax, tax reform happened, and some other things that are helping make the U.S. a more competitive place, which is why I get back to having better policy. It's an overarching thing. I, I, I get that it's an overarching thing. I'm actually talking about not necessarily your customer base of, okay. of diversification. I'm talking about sectors that have gotten harder hit than others. I mean, it's, it's your industry, it sounds like, in fact, has boomed, right? Agriculture and a lot of the companies that supply in agriculture, whether they're equipment manufacturers, bin makers, you know, drainage tiling companies, things like that, they have been negatively impacted. They've seen some increase in their inputs, you're saying, the steel and aluminum tariffs, is that what you're more oh, they've referring been, to? They've been extremely, they're much, much higher cost right now. Yeah. So how do you, in, in given that this has been going on for so long, then from your point of view, you see that the, that the tariffs are benefit for that for the Illinois economy? Uh, well, for the Illinois economy, and I would say that you know we've seen a higher increase in prices as well. We've seen our inputs go up, some of our steel and aluminum, and some of it has had nothing to do with the tariff. I, I think the tariffs were an excuse for price increases. You know, people have been really struggling with profits lately, so it's I think sometimes good to see a little bit. We've had no inflation. Sometimes inflation is a little bit good for profits, right? Uh, 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 but um, and we still haven't seen any inflation. You know, with these tariffs, everybody predicted price increases. It's been relatively low. Uh, so you know, some people have seen increases but I think there's some noise in the marketplace that needs to work its way out, some shortages and certain things. And as new suppliers, new domestic suppliers come online to make that pipe, make that whatever it is that goes into the input, we will see that noise and those prices settle out a little bit. So do you and, and as far as picking winners and losers, I feel yeah. like we've been thrown under the bus for a while, you know, for a long time. And so I'd rather that no industry gets thrown under the bus. But, you know, like I said, for a long time, the farm industry has been sold very well in the trade agreements and manufacturers have been the trade-off. So it's going the other way. I don't like that, but I, I think there's a better way to do it. Peter, do you agree? Do you agree that for years and years, the ag sector has actually been the ones who have benefited more than manufacturers? So I've represented a very conflicted constituency in the west and northwest suburbs. Uh, on the one hand, I've got had a lot of manufacturers like Zach who, um, whose, whose basic lament that he articulated, I've heard for any number of years. On the other hand, I've had other people who've said, hey, I sell rubber gloves and there's a billion Chinese customers. I don't care what happens, I, wanna, I want access to that marketplace. And therein, I think, lies sort of the rub about where we are from an economic point of view. So. We're, uh, we're, we're sort of conflicted. And I think it's interesting to take a step back and just kind of widen the aperture for a second and to look um, when, when both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump said the same thing during one of, the, one of the debates, that is, they both said they wanted to get out of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that's a paradigm shift in American politics. Because what you see then is both political parties doing what? basically embracing a mercantilist worldview, essentially. That was the subtext of that. Now, you got kind of the sense that um, you, you didn't really know if it was just for political consumption at that point, but Trump won. And now, I mean, he picked up on one of Brian's themes, basically, because Brian said a couple minutes ago, hey, we, these, these prices have been down for six years. And that's the explicit pitch of essentially 
the Trump administration saying, hey, it hasn't been working for you. You've basically got nothing to lose. See what I can, let, let's see what I can, um, what, what I can do in terms of renegotiating some of these things. Was it a mistake to try to renegotiate multiple trade deals all at the same time as opposed to taking one at a time? It was either a mistake or brilliant, and we don't know which. So when, when I gen generally have been talking about this, you, you, can, you can imagine this, this PJ going one of a couple directions. You can say, okay, renegotiation. So Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau came to the Ways and Means Committee. Um, like when, when the debate basically started, which is an unusual thing for a foreign head of state to do. They go and they meet with the executive branch, but he knew we were the, ta we were the tariff committee, so he came to see us. And he, I, he made a good pitch to us. He said, look, um, we, we know you don't like our IP treatment. We, don't, we know you don't like our treatment uh, of dairy, but then he kind of paused dramatically and he said, you sell a lot of things in our country. Now, ultimately, that the, at least the executive branch side of the USMCA has come together. Where the votes are on Capitol Hill on this, I think everybody's completely overestimating this and that there's a long way to go on that. But then the Europeans come. Over, not, overestimating the support, the, the support for USMCA? On, right, the support, on, the support on Capitol <clears throat> Hill. And I think there's a lot of presumption on both sides. I think the White House is presuming that there's more Democrats there, and, there and, and there's a lot of Republicans that are assuming there's more Republicans there. This is just my instinct. But then you look at the Europeans come around and, and say, we want to we wanna make a deal. And this is all within the context of these discussions that are really multidimensional that the Trump administration is having with President Xi, not just as it relates to trade, but as it relates to North Korea and other security issues and so forth. So this is either great or it'll be a disaster, and we just don't know which. Right. With regards to USMCA, I know there's been a lot of news that's been coming out of Mexico. The current president of, of Mexico has made it pretty clear that he wants his country to be more self-reliant with regards to production of food, you know, boost their own manufacturing industries, diversify their supply chain with regards to grains and feed and, and foodstuffs. How does that play, given the uncertainty over USMCA? Is there any sense, from your point of view, that that's one more hurdle to try to get this passed? Clearly, it's one more hurdle. The question is, what's and, and you contextualized it just now in, in how you articulated the question, but what we don't know is, what's really the political environment in which he's operating? Is that just for the benefit of a particular constituency, for example, or is he suggesting essentially um, a, a, a not really a renegotiating, but a little bit of I'm just saying politics, and, um, and I, I don't have enough insight into what's really happening inside the Mexican political structure at this point. But if you're hearing that from a leader, that means there's an additional hurdle for sure. Okay. Brian? Yeah. Um, I think Zach and I are probably just going to have to disagree quite a bit here. But <laughs> You're still a nice guy, though. <laughs> I can't imagine a world without the trade agreements when Zach says there's been no, well, I think he's, I heard him say there hadn't been a lot of benefit to him. I think world peace is a pretty good benefit. I think we need to go back. I think there's a lot of context we need to put to this, PJ. First of all, we need to say, what are tariffs? They're taxes, all right? They are taxes on, on the American people for buying goods from another country. Their taxes. When when the president when President Trump brags that the coffers are running over with tariff dollars, those are paid by American people. And I think we need to talk about this in contextually, and, and con maybe congressmen can talk about this. Who in the Constitution is given the authority to in place taxes? That would be Congress, my friend. That would be Congress. <laughs> so I think we need to talk about this. In, this, in the scope of, A, did the president have the authority to do this? 232 tariffs are for um, national security. Mexico and Canada, a big threat. I, I'm not sure. Uh, 301 tariffs, I think probably there's an argument to be made. And, and, and Zach, no one disagrees that China's a bad actor. Um, I think we need to still put this in the context of where we've come from in trade to where we are today and the gains and what it's meant, what it has meant to not only people in this country,
but to people around the world. Uh, and so I think we have, we had to have to have uh, some context to this discussion. We don't just want to take a snapshot in time. And then another thing on jobs created winners versus losers. I think Zach's figure, I think I wrote down, was 264,000 new manufacturing jobs. According to Chris Hurt from Purdue University, the month after the tariffs were announced, the value of the six major ag commodities, corn, soybeans, wheat, pork, beef, dairy, declined by $20 billion. If I do the math, Zach, I could pay each one of your manufacturers $100,000 a year. I mean, that's, it is winners versus losers. And I think we need to ask ourselves what a world looks like in which tariffs as blunt instruments are just used as negotiating tools. Would we like that if other countries all of a sudden, if just unilaterally, put major tariffs on us? No, we'd go to the WTO, we'd take a case, which interestingly, China just lost a major case in the WTO on farm subsidies. I have no problem with fair trade. I have no problem with holding countries accountable. I worry, and agriculture worries, about what does the future look like. Um, I think tariffs have been effective in, in bringing down barriers around the world and opening doors to more products. Have they always been implemented perfectly? No. Are there, are there places for improvement? I'd like to talk about the EU precautionary principle and why geopolitically some countries have been able to get by with some things. Why has China for 19 years been able to get by? Well, I think there's geopolitical reasons that maybe other presidents didn't hold them to account. North Korea, perhaps. So, but I think throwing out trade agreements is, it would be devastating to the world as we know it. Zach? Yes, well, again, Brian, I think you and I actually agree more than we disagree. I, I really do. Um, I think, you know, our country was built, actually, on, on protectionism, right? And, and that's what brought this country. I'm a Hamiltonian, actually, uh, underneath a lot of this. And Hamilton was a big proponent of the tariffs. They had this debate way back when. And, you know, that's how we built this country and the wealth of this country and all of the global security that we enjoy. Uh, you know, the, the, the saying about the speak softly and carry the big stick. And so when we get back to, you know, when we started trading things away and giving away our wealth and our strength through these, in my argument, poor trade agreements. It's not about not having them. But, um, you know, so you mentioned the, the Section uh, 232 tariffs on national security. The reason it's on everybody is because it's not a matter of friend or foe. It's a matter of we need to have this industry in this country because it's national security. If we don't make steel and aluminum and something goes wrong, it doesn't matter, if, you know, who's friend or foe. It's that we need to have it here. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a we're against Canada kind of thing. It was that we need to have a healthy industry for those things. We have made that as a strategic choice to have steel and aluminum in this country here. Can and I, so, can I just to ask a follow-up on just that point? Uh -huh. Could the same argument be made, though, about national security over food supply? Well, yes, exactly, and, and, I, and this is why I'm saying I think they didn't act fast enough to protect our farmers and that I think our farmers are being, you know, none of us should be sold out here. I think there have been bad policies in the past that have sold all of us out in one way or another, and we need to get out of that. It shouldn't be us uh, against each other. We should be working better with better policies. So now the tariffs against China, again, you know, the Europeans agree with us, and Congressman, I suppose you probably know more than I do about these kind of things, but they've been uh, he, speaking quietly, you know, behind the scenes with, with the White House. You saw what happened this summer. They're just as bothered with the China problem as we are, right? And they're worried about losing their industry, too. And the Europeans in general have been much better about protecting industry, and they have, quite frankly, a tax system that's set up with a VAT tax that is a, a, a tax on imports and a subsidy on exports. We are the only country in the world, and I know you and I spoke about this at length during tax reform. Can, Canada has the goods and services tax. It's the same kind of thing. So does India. We are the only country, I think, other than North Korea and Iran that doesn't have some sort of a border adjustability in our tax system. And so the Europeans do a great job of it. Germany is extremely protectionist. Look how much American beer is sold there and think about how much German beer is sold here. So, you know, these countries want to say that we're protectionist. They want to say we're doing all the wrong thing, but they're all doing it too. They're doing it in a smarter way because they have policies in place. They have plans in place to do these things. So again, I think the tariffs are necessary not just for negotiation but for keeping industries healthy and I think there are better ways to solve it through better tax systems better tax policies that could help but wouldn't you so right now though if you're in steel and aluminum manufacturing how much money are you going to invest in a new plant knowing that the only thing that keeps you in business is a is a administration who just put a tax in place 
Is that what you want to be as your competitive advantage? Well, it shouldn't be. I hope it's a short-term thing. That's what I'm saying. There are other longer-term solutions. But, you know, somewhere in my notes I have some data about all the jobs. And these solar plants, I mean, we put these solar tariffs on. There's 13 new solar manufacturing facilities in this country. There's, you know, 2,000 new aluminum jobs, 4,000 new steel jobs. So... Right. <clears throat> so let me kind of take a step forward. Please. Clearly, the two of you have different opinions oh, that's about fine. this. He, it's for, that's, it's perfectly acceptable that he's wrong. That's fine. <laughs> I am fine with that. <laughs> I won't be so. I, I think we're both right. <laughs> um, so let's do best case, worst case scenarios, right? Which is the thing that journalists always love to do. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty of what's coming. Um, best case scenario is, I'm actually going to bypass both of you and Please. say, Peter, from the, from the, from the kind of both the political but more like the economic point of view, what's the best case scenario at this point for both industries? So best case scenario is <clears throat> um, st starts at China and ends at USMCA. So it starts at China. and. And, and the dialogue between the two presidents and the recognition that President Xi has ba basically, China has bitten off more than they can chew. Um, I came back from a conference there a couple of years ago and I told my wife Elizabeth, um, we've got challenges, they've got troubles. And the troubles in China are, their political rights are out of sync with their economic rights. They've bitten off way more than they can chew in the South China Sea. They're on the verge of a per personality cult with President Xi. No leader in China has had the type of authority since Mao Zedong that he has. Um, at the time, North Korea was being incredibly provocative, and they've got cooked into their economic models. They've got to grow at 8 or 9%. Otherwise, they've got social unrest. That's very, very, that, that, that's troubles. So the best case scenario is President Xi recognizes that and basically says, look, to Trump, give us a 10-year glide path. This, I think, is the much smarter move, kind of all the way around. And I hope that there's some level, PJ, of strategic discussion that's going on in this. Give us a 10-year glide path in terms of what, what we need to do in terms of intellectual property, rule of law, the subsidies, and so forth. And we're going to be at a, better, at a better position. Then both sides declare victory. But, you know, and, and you can, that's not crazy talk to think that that could actually happen. If that happens, creates a lot of space around which um, the European questions get reconciled, and then ultimately USMCA seems like a, just kind of a walk in the park. That's the best case. <laughs> worst case, <laughs> worst case is I see your 200 billion and I'll raise you another 200 billion. And then you get into this, this, um, this staring down and, and very provocative politics, which isn't helpful. Now, let me just make one other just quick point with your permission. I think we're in this season right now, and we have not had a big trade debate in this country in a long time. And there are many people that, that aren't really sure about where their views are on trade. And there's sort of been presumptions on the part of sort of traditional free trade people like me, and we've, we've fallen into the trap of assuming, oh, this is really intuitive. Everybody understands this. It's not intuitive. And during the tax debate that we just went through, you, there were a number of sort of trade overlays. Um, Zach mentioned this border adjustment. If I kept you up and denied you for food for five days, I could talk you into this, but um, it, it, it's not going to happen. Um, but it's a, it, what it suggests is there's, uh, there's been a lack of a very robust trade debate in this country in at least a decade. And now it's here. And I, look, I welcome it. I think it's a good thing that we're having a discussion like that, that we're having this, this kind of um, back and forth between sectors. But this either goes fabulously well, in my view, or it, it, it just doesn't end well at all. I don't see a middling path here. Do you think if it doesn't end well at all, it will end up impacting negatively both sectors? particularly for the state of Illinois? I do. I mean, so the state of Illinois, as you know, has its own buzzkill going on. Trying to set that aside. All right. So, okay. But it's hard to set that aside. So, so uh, other Midwestern states are not as vulnerable as the state of Illinois based on our fiscal situation. Right. So, um, but let's assume for the sake of argument that all these things were equal. And um, I think even if they were equal, there would be an incredible pressure. Look, 
what, what I learned representing a constituency for 12 years in Chicagoland is we make things, we grow things, and we sell things abroad. So worldwide American markets are incredibly important to the Chicagoland economy. And it's in our best interest that this get, gets reconciled as soon as possible. OK. So best case scenario, worst case scenario for farmers and for manufacturers, I understand. Um, is there a point from the manufacturing point of view that you see that it actually could end up if it drags on, if, if the talks with China drag on, if USMCA doesn't get signed or perhaps adjusted or it gets clogged up in political quagmire, if the EU suddenly decides that it's going to do something different, you know, do you see a point where there is actually a negative tipping point for the manufacturing industry? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I'm fairly supportive actually of the USMCA. I think it's it's a good agreement. Um, I think you know, manufacturers, we've we've watched, and and when you say we make things, and, and we do in Illinois, and, and again, but the big companies have really been benefiting from that. Mm -hmm. You know, the caterpillars that you think about, those are the ones who are doing the exports. And again, I'm a supply chain, so I sell into them, and if and if I'm selling the caterpillar, they're exporting, and, and I'm I'm benefiting. But you know, uh, so so we need to have that happening. But really, what we're seeing, particularly again, again with Asia, we are the wealthiest market in the world. We are the consumers. We are the ones buying everything in this world. I mean, there are other people buying, but we far outweigh everybody else. This is the consumer market. Mm -hmm. So you know, if we're not selling to ourselves, if we're not making things that we can sell in this country, and we're just consuming all the time, this is a slow degradation of this country and a slow sucking of our wealth out to these other countries. And so we really need to do it better. Again, better policies. And I, and I come back to you know the trade agreements, I think we do need to pass some the, you know, the USMCA, I hope it does pass, but then I hope we quickly get on to dealing with our bloated and overvalued dollar, because it'll help me, and for every 1% decrease in the dollar, he's going to see a 2.5% increase in his farm prices. There's studies that show that, you know, so, wow. so and, and the farm problems predated, the farmers have been struggling with oversupply and global overcapacity far before tariffs came, far before any of this all happened here, so this, this is has been true, going on but, for a long the, time. But the reason there was a peak in 2012 was because there was a drought. There was okay. a and a specific thing and there that was a specific event that ended up right. it was actually not just one year it was a number of years that led up to that that ended up causing massive ripple effects across the US agricultural industry it, it the tariffs though I don't think anybody would argue that the trade war with China has had a has had a massively negative effect on grain prices therefore on grain producers and has been in some cases a a bit of a tipping point for for farm operations, or if, am I if, wrong, Brian? If, no, I mean, and that's why that's why the timing of this couldn't have been worse. And and I think as you ask, best case, worst case scenario, I think, and again, I, I applaud the administration for elevating this discussion. I think it's it's good for for the country. I hope the country remembers its history. I hope we remember what the effects were of some tariffs previously called Smoot Hawley. Uh, the Great Depression. Um, the Depression happened first, and the tariffs came yes. second. Actually, but I it exacerbated it exacerbated yes. the, the problems around the Depression. I think if you look and as you look at agriculture, here's here's what I know. All right, I was doing projections last year at this time, uh, based on what the markets were were showing they were going to give me, and we raise a lot of hogs too, PJ. And uh, we market about 70,000 hogs a year. Uh, at the time that I did my projections at this time last year, we were showing uh, about $18 a head more than what we ended up at the end of the year. And again, dramatic meaning, loss. Meaning what you, the what, farmer yeah, can the, the, sell. Yeah, what the for. farmer could sell up the pork for. And again, this is, would be consistent with what I, Iowa State economists said. The pork industry's lost $12 a head due to USMCA, the countervailing duties that, that Mexico has put on, and $8 a head actually to China. Actually, the, the 232 tariffs have cost us more on the hog side than the trade war with China has. But these are economic realities. So if you talk 20, if you talk $17 a head on our operation, a family farm, it's a million dollar hit to us. And there's family farms like me all over, all around the, the Midwest that are that are experiencing this. Um, yeah, we oversupply. We're really good at producing. Um, we're competitively placed 
to be the least cost producers of pork and of grain and of dairy in the world. And that's why trade means so much to us. Right. So to follow up on you guys that the farming industry does produce itself. Mm -hmm. You know, it is very good at producing. I mean, seed technology has gotten to the point mm -hmm. where yields are crazy large now. Um, but is that not actually a problem for the farm community itself? Farmers historically have produced themselves into bus time and time <laughs> and time again. Is it, not, is it not incumbent on farmers not to take on aggressive debt, not to outproduce, and to see, I mean, the man, I mean, to play devil's advocate, mm -hmm. from the manufacturing side, they had to adapt, mm -hmm. right? Yep. They lost markets, but companies went out of business, and mm -hmm. then they adapted to be able to figure out you know, where to go forward. Our but farmers- you, Yeah, but PJ, we're different. Agriculture is different in that we're dealing with a biological product. Whether it's plants or animals, we can't speed up or slow down the factory. And I know that's simplifying. I don't mean to simplify manufacturing, but I can't control my output by changing my line speed. My hogs make what they make. I can't, the way I cut back on raising hogs is slaughtering breeding stock. I mean, those are, and as you look at stocks to use ratio on corn right now, we're tied. that in, in non -ag What speak. we grow versus what we consume. Right. It's called stocks, what we have on hand of corn versus what we use. Our stocks to use ratio is relatively tight. I mean, in my lifetime, it used to be when I started farming, we wondered what we could ever do with an 8 billion bushel corn crop. Now we need between 14 and 15 billion bushels with all the, the advancements in consumption and biofuels and exports, everything that we do. So we have worked on on the demand side as well in agriculture. Um, and so we made decisions based on what we thought was obvious to the world, that mm -hmm. trade mattered. And so then when those decisions that you made are all of a sudden by the, the, by the dropping of a tariff, made to look really, really stupid. The hog industry has a, you know, we in, we in farming, we like to pour concrete. We do that really well. You know, what are we gonna build? What are we gonna invest in? And those are long-term investments. When I build a hog building, I plan on it being there for 20 to 30 years and probably you know, having a 15-year amortized debt on it and then hoping to make some money on the back 15 years. So we're making long-term decisions. And, and we thought we knew the rules. We thought agriculture, agriculture thought we knew the rules. But did the manufacturing industry also do the same thing when, when trade deals came into place and it forced them to have the same difficult discussions? I, I would say yes, and, and again, I go back to the Hamilton, and, and Jefferson was a farmer, and he was in favor of free trade back then, and you know what, he agreed that for national security and to have a market at home and to have his farm here at home, let's say, if he, he backed down on, on the tariff issue, and, and you know, I would say that about the farmers, you know, you are the, I feel your pain because you are the most productive, technological, highly advanced farming industry in the world. You're so productive, but farmers are killing themselves. I mean, literally, they, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you, they are su committing suicide, suicide because of the debt, yeah. and it's a horrible problem. I'm not making light of it. Yeah. That's, that underscores the issue here. And we see the same thing in rural America with manufacturers, people who lost these good jobs, this change thing. The reason we have President Trump, a lot of them are the same people who voted for President Obama. They are looking back and forth for someone mm -hmm. to help solve their problem. They're vacillating here in rural America because they don't have good jobs. The farmers are hooding and usually in manufacturing, there's a good little manufacturer in your town in every farming community. Right. And those people left. So I think we really do have some underlying problems here, here that, that that, that need to be okay. addressed. Last Sorry. question. No, 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 you're fine. No, last and question. I don't disagree with that. I so mean, last question before we go to Q&A to Peter. Yeah. So we are, as we discussed a little earlier, we're already in a presidential election cycle. Already. What so early. Oh, <laughs> so fun. Um, so in all seriousness, trade, I know that this is not necessarily perhaps the hot button issue in the presidential election cycle right now, but it's not not being discussed. So from both the Republican point of view as well as the Democratic point of view, going into this next election cycle, how do you see each party playing the trade fights? Your eyes literally lit up when he mentioned the two presidential candidates. Yes. Um, <laughs> it was like, wow, great segue, man. Um, literally, was like, PJ was like, bingo. And we're going, because we've got time for one last question. So, so uh, keep it short. OK, so it there's. Uh, just to unpack this a little bit, PJ, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. So one dynamic is 
In some ways, Donald Trump is echoing themes that I've heard from Ways and Means Democrats for years mm -hmm. in terms of pushing harder on these trade deals and so forth. And there's, there's this odd confluence that, um, that I've observed. Now, what is also true is there's, there's, uh, there's an oppositional dynamic in terms of if Donald Trump is for it, then there's certain people that say, I am against it. Yep. And it's just, it's a, it's a polar dynamic right now in, in American politics. So it sort of goes back to this underlying discussion about how do we feel about trade? What, where are we? And we lapsed, I would argue, that our country lapsed into a temptation towards mercantilism. And I think the temptation grew when the economy was moving slowly. And I observed that it was very easy to demagogue trade or to over, uh, to over characterize trade when in fact other factors were, were, were significant. So go back, to, go back to the constituency that I, that I represented for a number of years. So Zach and uh, the, the group that he represents, basically, they observed a, a changing marketplace and now they're, they're manufacturing five times to the right of a decimal then manufacturing five times to the right of a decimal. It's amazing precision. And they basically shedded a lot of stuff that, were, that, that wasn't, um, there wasn't much of a percentage in it. They said, we're, we're going to go in this direction, and today are, are flourishing. So as we move into the 2020 cycle, what you're going to see is, I think, the president dog whistling a lot of Democratic uh, candidates out there and sort of shadow boxing with them and, and over, trade. over trade. And I think that you'll see, last point, I think it's more likely true than not true based on the rules of the Democratic National Committee right now, and we can go through this in detail, but that, uh, that there's not likely to be a nominee, uh, a Democratic nominee in the middle of March. This is just Peter Roskam speculating, but I'm right. telling you, you heard it here first. And um, that leaves a four-month period of time until that convention, in which case um, I think the president is going, to be, is going to be very aggressive on a number of these issues. And I think, um, I, I think 2020 is going to be a lot more competitive than most people think. Great. All right. So questions from the audience? Anyone? Because we'll just keep talking. <laughs> Yes. Hi, my name is Indy, and I'm a first year. Um, I have a question that's kind of a little more agriculturally focused. How do you see climate change affecting American agriculture and policy? Uh, that's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I. It's a you and Brian. I think it's Peter. a I think it's a mixed uh, for agriculture as you look at climate change. Uh, does it mean maybe a longer growing season? Does it mean wetter summers? Um, you know, that's beneficial uh, from, a, from a pure production standpoint. And so I, I think there's a lot of unknown. And, and uh, for me, the biggest effect that I see on, from climate change is bad policies being enacted that aren't well thought out, that have a lot of um, unintended consequences that affect my business. That Again, I talk about an issue that can be demagogued. I agree on this. Hey, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that the demagoguery around this issue um, I, scares me. Policy right now scares me more than climate change. Mm. That's for me. And, and you control the policy in this country, but we don't control all those other countries. So you're burdening us with higher costs and higher regulations, yep. well-intentioned, and with good, hopeful outcomes, but we're really not the problem always in the world anymore. It's these under, other countries coming up, particularly, again, China, they're, they're, they're uh, pretending they're a developing nation. They are not. They're a very wealthy country, and, and they're not being held to the same standards. Meanwhile, they, so they don't, uh, you know, their farmers can pollute, their manufacturers, oh, the manufacturers can pollute. It's, it's a terrible thing, and it's all blowing this way and floating this way. So it's really a global problem, and we can't solve the problem in a vacuum ourselves. Just to, um, just to follow up a little bit, one of the um, there's there's 
the power of the federal government is just breathtaking. And I know I'm, I know I'm stating the obvious, but it, the obvious sometimes needs to be articulated. So when the federal government comes up with a policy, it can just be so difficult to move it and so difficult to adjust it and to be nimble and so forth. And so Brian will remember this. There was a policy that was called the Waters of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And this was an initiative to regulate, at first glance, you think, oh, hey, it makes perfect sense. We're regulating streams and, uh, and so forth. Oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> You're regulating, like no joke, puddles. Yep. Puddles on his piece of property. That's not an overstatement. And the that, land around it. Right, okay, so yeah, you take my point. It just that's, becomes obtuse. Yeah. So the, sh the joint shudder that your question brought through these two men right here, and I could feel it right here. <laughs> the joint shudder was basically, you know, a group of people that says, hey, I got a wonderful plan for your business, and I got a wonderful <laughs> plan for your farm. Uh -oh. And um, that's, that's, that is, um, it's based on bumper stickers as opposed to really driving the science. And so we're in the, I think everybody's in the midst of really sorting this out. But what's so interesting is you look at the American Enterprise Institute, for example, which is a think tank in DC, and they've done some work that, that looks at our carbon footprint in the US based on market pressures for the carbon footprint to be improved, a, a very significant thing. So from my point of view, I think we would be much better off looking at the types of things where, where, where Zach says, hey, you know, I, 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 wanna, I wanna lessen my carbon footprint from a manufacturing point of view, here's how I'm proposing to do it. Or Brian says, I wanna lessen my carbon footprint on my farm with Kelly, his wife, and so forth, and, and that's terrific. But wow, when you have a federal standard that comes down, like for real, you're, you're, you're regulating puddles on farms, which is what nobody really contemplated. Then, um, just to follow up, there's actually, you end up running into also situations where there's good intentions, but then you have conflicting regulations. Either, like the thing I'm thinking of is the state of California is a big dairy industry. There was a big movement to be able to capture the methane coming off of known as dairy digesters. So cows eat, they poop, poop collected, put into big pits, methane that comes off that collected turned into natural gas that can get sold back into the power grid. Everybody wins, right? You are preventing from the gases from being released. The problem was, um, and there were all these farmers that wanted to do this. There were tons of farmers that were like, sign me up, this sounds great. There were conflicting regulations on the state level. So there was federal money. One state regulator uh, group had certain rules that said you have to do it this way. A separate state regulatory group said you have to do it a different way, and they conflicted. So if the farmers designed their, digest their, uh, their dairy digester systems using a certain kind of engine, they all got penalized and shut down. If they did it the other way, they got penalized and shut down. So there's, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> the, there's, I mean, there is, even in the best of situations, there are, there are hurdles. And not to pile on, but you've provoked me with this question. Just, <laughs> just sort of one other, one other point, and it's to highlight something that PJ made implicitly, and it's um, sometimes there's a race to who gets to pick the technology that's used. And there's a little bit of crony capitalism that can weigh in here. And what you will see, plus if you come to my seminar, um, <laughs> hey, Beyond hey. the Bumper Sticker, which is this week, um, then uh, what, what you'll see is sometimes there's a discussion that's get, that gets cloaked in goodness and mercy and light and wonderful virtue. But the subtext is we're going we're gonna to compel you to buy a product or buy a technology that we sell. And it's crony capitalism, it's a manipulation, and it's very, very dark. And it is alive and well, and you gotta know how to spot it. And I can teach you how to spot it. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Next. Yes. I'm Felipe, and I'm uh, from the Harris School of Public Policy. And uh, this question goes for SAC. Um, you talked about uh, strategic tariffs, uh, border adaptability, uh, charging for mar market access. Uh, could you elaborate what you see in an ideal trade deal? 
Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> Which trade deal are you talking about with China, with USMCA? Uh, nothing specific I had in mind, but perhaps, yeah, perhaps with China. Well, yeah, you know, with China, I think a good trade deal would, would involve them. You know, I don't want to see us become, you know, it, you know, go back to the days of the imperialism, right? You had these colonies sending them all the natural resources. I would hate for the U.S. to become the colony sending our natural resources to China. They're going to buy our gas, our soybeans, and all that stuff. That's wonderful. But they need to find a way in a good trade agreement. They're buying the commodities that they need, and they're also finding a way to buy our higher-valued manufactured products as well and to keep us somehow in the supply chain. Also, companies like mine, you know, they're finding ways to protect my customers' IP stuff. So, again, I, I talked about Huawei building a global enterprise based on copying and stealing our technology. That was developed by Lucent and Nortel Networks and, you know, all of these Western companies. So we find a way to protect the IP. We find a way to get the commodities sold. But also we see some back and forth trade in the higher level manufactured goods. And it's not just a, a competition on price. I would also like to see their, their currency. I don't believe that they are right now competitively devaluing their currency anymore. But I think we need some, again, I talked a lot about currency, some currency mechanisms in a smart trade agreement um, so that they don't competitively devalue and or we find a way to bring the dollar back to a trade balancing equilibrium value. That would be great. And, um, you know, uh, so, so again, I think those are the basic things that I would want to see in the agreement there. Oh, and access to their market because we really haven't gotten access to their market the way they promised. They keep saying and dangling it and dangling it, and meanwhile they're figuring everything out and taking our industry after industry. So I would love to get access to that big market that we've all been counting on for so long. Yes? Hi, my name is Brandon and I work in the private industry. My, my question would be, um, what about Americans relying more on the domestic market? Because when you talk about federal re regulation, uh, there's really no incentive for growers or farmers to actually convert their farms to or organic crop where they can actually get a premium for, for their crops. So my question is, I guess in terms of, we spend a lot of time talking about the international market, but I guess what are some of the mechanisms and policies that we can put in place to really stimulate the domestic market where we're not so much relied upon, you know, China and some of the, the international um, countries. Uh, you want to take this one or I, I, can, I, can, I can follow up. I mean, I got Yeah, I, well, I can. Yeah. I, well, I, I like the idea of the, the innovation that you mentioned, and again, it's about that's what we did in manufacturing, Congress. When you mentioned mm -hmm. the five five decimal past the decimal point, we got to super precision. I want, my, I'd love to make some of the easy products again, but those are all gone. So, uh, but but that's because of price, right? And and so when the U.S. consumer wants the lowest price, it, it, you've got to innovate and try to find a way to differentiate on price. So I can't speak for my friends in farming, but I know I, I do have some some smaller farmers that I know that have been really successful in shrinking down and focusing on specialty products and developing relationships with restaurants and things like that, this whole local. So the same thing that happened in manufacturing could maybe happen there, but still we got to get out of this price cycle. Yeah, and they're specialty markets because they're specialties. They're small by definition. Uh, the, the premiums uh, for organic production, and again, you can send me down a different rabbit trail here, are not enough to compensate for the increased costs and the loss, the absolute loss of production. And again, it is a niche market. It's small. Most consumers are not willing to pay those kind of premiums for a product that there is no differentiation at the end of the day. People shop at Walmart and Costco, and, and that's what they can afford, and that's where they go. Not very many people go to Whole Foods. And, and so as you look at at commercial agriculture, as you say, developing domestic market, are you all going to start eating more? I didn't think so. 95% and 95% of the world's mouths live outside these, these borders. And we can grow the food. Uh, pork is the number one protein choice around the world. You've still got a significant part of the world population that does not consume enough calories daily. That answer is, is here, and it's in technology, and it's in production. Um, contracting a market and giving up on customers does not seem to be a good business plan, not just for agriculture, but for a lot of businesses. Part of the other issue is, um, so let's take organics, right? The, the process of turning a field to make a field organic is long, expensive, difficult, 
Um, you're farming against, first of all, farmland values are very expensive. So let's say you're coming into this cold and you decide that you have this dream of running an organic sweet corn, right? Mm -hmm. Sweet corn Great. farm, yeah. right? Because corn is fabulous. And so you, let's say somehow you come up with the money, okay? Somehow you get to know all the neighbors so that when they're spraying their chemistry, it doesn't end up drifting over and killing all your crops. It's gonna take five years to be able to convert the field and get it certified organic through USDA. Regulations on it are a little bit iffy, but the key thing that I've been told time and again, the issue is supply chain, right? If, so there's a lot, there's a big push with organic milk. And a lot of, a lot of people wanna be able to give their kids organic milk, they wanna drink organic milk, Cows need organic feed, right? Right now in this country, the United States, for organic dairy producers, they import more of their organic feed overseas because there's literally not a, a good enough or efficient enough supply chain to be able to produce enough feed to meet that demand. I mean, there's, there are gaps that can get fixed, but there's really no easy answers on how to be able to fix it. And consumers will not? line up to go spend ten dollars a gallon for organic milk right but i think i it's think it's raise their incomes that that's where I, and i think the congressman i don't think they'll do still this. spend ten dollars a gallon for milk that has no difference between organic milk and regular milk there's it's, it's the same product so i mean that thinks well that's, if we have no middle class right <laughs> that, that's the problem you've lost the wealth to pay a more for a premium product if we can get people's incomes up they will enjoy buying a premium product and, and a differentiated product right I think I mean, for a domestic market, yes. But Brian's not wrong. I mean, no, there's correct, a massive right. global appetite for protein. There's no one answer to these questions, actually, yeah. but yes. Yeah. Next. Is there any other students before we call on anybody else? Okay. Hi, my name is Angela Seeger. I'm a third year in the college. And uh, my question is, from a cultural and political standpoint, how has the farming industry changed over the past years? And also, how has the manufacturing industry changed over the past 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Flip glad it. that you think I've only been at it for 20 years. Um, you know, a lot, of, a, a lot has changed, but a lot has remained the same. So let's talk about what's changed. We've gotten bigger. We've gotten more efficient. I mean, when you want to talk about carbon footprints compared to what we are now to what we were then. When I started farming, uh, if you could wean seven and a half pigs just from a litter, from one litter of solid seven and a half, that was great. Now they're weaning 12 and 13. I mean, we've just gotten so much better in production. Corn, 300 bushel of the acre. When I started farming, 150 was spectacular. So we've gotten, we've gotten so much better. But yet, I think there's been a consistent thread uh, in the connectedness of the family to the land. I live in the house I grew up in. My kids grew up, grew up in that house. They all want to be involved in agriculture uh, because they love farming, they love the land, they love their livestock, they, they love growing crops. And uh, the lifestyle and that connectedness to the land culturally still remains the same. And it's been the same generally, generationally, whether you farmed with a hoe or a horse or an auto steer tractor. You don't do this job because you know, you're going to think you're going to get rich. You do it because you love the land, and it's a great place to raise a kid and families. That's a great answer, and actually very similar to, to, to my answer. I'll talk about the changes I've seen, but I'm the fourth generation of my family to do this. We've been here in Chicago manufacturing for over 100, 101 years this year, and, and we do it because this is what we do. We love it. I work with my two sisters. I work with my father, great family business, 80 employees, and, you know, my peers that, that the congressman talked about uh, in these man small businesses, we're all the same. We, we're a multi-generational family, and you have good years and bad years. And uh, I'm, I'm finally seeing some good years after almost 20 years of bad years, since 2000, when, when, when China joined the W, you know, got, got most favored nation status, and when all that, that world changed, that's when we saw this slow, and then it got faster and faster, degradation of the small, the supply chain, the family businesses, the small and mid-sized manufacturers. We just got hollowed out where people like Caterpillar, you know, all these other big companies were buying the products overseas, putting it, maybe putting it together here, maybe, and then selling it back to the market. So we're finally seeing us to find a spot in there. And like uh, 
about Peter said, we had to innovate and change and reinvent. So I went from making high volume products that we used to stamp out millions or tens of thousands or whatever into super niche, low volume, high complexity work. And it required so much more training and so much more thought and input. The people we employ now are A, making more money and B, super highly skilled workers now. So a lot of our people without a college degree are making six figures without debt. It's a good career, but it's become much harder. And then technology has played a whole nother role in it too, the whole automation of things. And you know, people are worried that the robots will replace people in manufacturing. I think they might replace some jobs in the service industry, and I would be happy to hire those people in manufacturing because we really need them right now, some good skilled workers, and they will work with the robots to help you know, keep the line running and stuff like that. So those are the changes we're seeing, I know. How much would a, a value-added tax uh, replace a lot of the trade policy issues? And is it possible that the whole tax system could be switched to a value-added tax? One reason I think it's been a non-starter is that it would be likely that any value-added tax would only be added to uh, the complexities of the income tax, so it would be even more monstrous and complicated. So is there a, a kind of political way that uh, the tax system could be completely simplified by replacing the current system with the value-added tax. Let me take a stab at that. So <laughs> we, um, uh, we really wrestled during the tax debate in general um, about sort of the, the, un the underlying structures, not just worldview assumptions as it related to tax policy, but then what you're, what you're taking is not worldview, but ultimately it's uh, kind of an implementation level. And the suspicion was the suspicion that you just articulated. That is, you can make, you can make a case for a value-added tax. In fact, there are some very conservative voices on the Ways and Means Committee that, that, that weighed in heavy on that. And there's literature and, 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 and so forth. The challenge is that it's got to be a replacement tax, mostly, from my point of view. And there's not a level of confidence that you'd really get rid of one level of taxation, and then that would be translated into the other other level of uh, other level of taxation. And literally, you'd um, you, you have some people that would never go for it unless you amended the constitution, and that's that's a very tall. Lift. In theory, what would Big the lift. impact of uh, what would an impact on a VAT tax be, say, on agriculture? I'd try to get an exemption. <laughs> Seriously, on any of those, and, and, and it's, I don't know a lot about it, okay, so I, I'm all over my skis, but one thing, you, I, get, I go back to this point with agriculture, we are price takers. I can't pay a tax on a good, on an input, and then just, and pass it on to my customer, and I know manufacturers, that's, I'm oversimplifying some of it with manufacturers, because I know you've got competition, but that, those kind of concepts, uh, you know, concern me, is it going to be levied on us in agriculture, then what it's, what's it going to do to us competitively? Okay. We have time for one last question. Thanks. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a second year here in the business school. Um, so my question is about sort of our overarching trade policy and how we communicate it. And we've heard some interesting things. I think we heard that uh, tariffs are taxes that make Americans worse off in general, uh, but there are some people who benefit from the tariffs. So you mentioned sort of 2,000, 4,000 workers who got jobs as a result of steel and aluminum tariffs. Uh, but you know, there's 320 million American consumers who have to pay more as a result. Um, and so Peter, you mentioned that the free trade's benefits aren't intuitive to most people, and we sort of haven't had this debate about what the benefits are and, and how do we deal with it. So how do we communicate the benefits of free trade in a way that's understandable? Uh, but then how do we remediate the, the you know, potential detrimental effects for those who are, who are adversely affected you know, in the manufacturing sector from some of the trade So deals? let me take a shot because okay. you called me out, and then I'll yield to you, my friend. Um, so uh, Andrew, I think, the, um, I think debates happen in the negative. In other words, if things are just going along, come on, this, you know this, human nature, things are going along and everything's going well, you don't care. Um, but if you've got some negative impact on your life and all of a sudden you're saying, hey, this is having an impact here or I'm paying more here, and it's that level of sort of um, uh, the way at which, the, the rate at which things come to your attention, I think that's, that's driving it. So I think that we're in, whether, whether one likes Donald Trump, whether one doesn't like Donald Trump, 
we're in this season right now where the country is basically said, okay, let's flip the game board and let's challenge some of these underlying assumptions. And it could be that we end up, we end up with a more robust discussion and a more informed constituency. Let me put it this way. Would any of you have been here, if you're not getting credit for this somehow, um, <laughs> you know, if it, but for this current debate five years ago? No, because it wasn't, it wasn't top of mind. And so I think that, that um, the ability to drive a, a consensus largely comes by us being pushed around by these big forces. Yeah, and just real quick to add on that, you know, we have experienced free trade for quite a while, quite a while. We know what that looks like. I know what that did to my industry and stuff. And I think the workers know what that feels like. We are just starting to experience a different, the game board has been flipped around. It's just starting to get better. So those jobs are just starting to come back. We need to give it some more time. And, you know, I don't think you, we need to explain to people the benefits of free trade. I think that's a very condescending, I'm sorry to say that, very condescending approach. I think, you know, people know if they're better off or not. And they're not. They're not feeling it outside of these urban areas, the wealth in America, the middle class has been suffering. They don't need anyone to sell it to them and say it's good, just keep waiting. They're done with that already and that's why we've seen the vacillating back and forth on political parties. They want something different and we're just starting to see it so I would urge more time, more caution, let this play out and see what happens. Brian? I think uh, there, no one's going to disagree that there needs to be some uh, modifications to our current systems. I, I think it's time, I think it's good to have this discussion. Uh, I think the enforcement mechanisms need to be talked about. I think how a country is listed as uh, developing or developed country and how a non-market economy fits in in a free trade system with market economies. I think these are all good discussions, but I, I want to come back to what the world looked like without a rules-based approach to trade. That's what's probably most troubling with me. And, 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 the, and I think the rules have for manufacturing maybe have been ignored for yeah, geopolitical geopolitical, rules, right? geopolitical reasoning. Right. So let's talk about enforcement mechanisms. Let's talk about strengthening that. But let's not pitch out a rules-based approach to trade. We've worked too hard for it. And I, I do think not only globally, but I, I will kindly disagree with you. I think we have benefited um, domestically as well from that approach. Right. Well, on that, we will wrap. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. And thank you, panelists, for joining. Thank you.